Davis followed teaching experiences at Harvard, where he was a teaching fellow, at Brandeis, and at McGill University. A Festrift was published in his honor in 1996, and he is now an honorary research fellow at University College uh, London and engaged in a project at Cambridge University in a lab there that is also working on neuroesthetics and the arts, and where he goes on, I believe, a very regular basis to work with uh, colleagues in uh, Cambridge. Irving's publications range from work on Shelley and Romanticism in the 1960s and 70s to books uh, called Identity and Community, Reflections on English, Yiddish, and French Literature in Canada, and another called Philo-Semitism in 19th century German literature. These were publications from the 1990s and 2000. To his most recent book, The Neural Imagination, uh, Aesthetic and Neuroscientific Approaches to the Arts, uh, which was published in 2009. He continues to speak internationally on the topic of literature and neuroscience. So that's a very impressive range um, for uh, several decades of this uh, career. And a somewhat more playful vein, uh, I should let you know that uh, Irving uh, still has devoted students from his many years of teaching at the University of Buffalo, uh, which I have learned in two ways. One is that last year when we had a uh, departmental reunion, many students came back uh, and some wrote me in advance asking if Irving Massey would be there. And when I said yes, they said, okay, then I'll come. Um, the uh, second way is that I made an announcement on our alumni listserv, um, letting people know that uh, Irving would be speaking today. And several of his former students wrote back saying they wished they could come, and only the fact that they lived a very great distance away was preventing them from being there. One wrote, would this be the same Irving Massey who was teaching during the 1970s and always appeared in a cape? <laughs> so I wrote to Irving and said, so? <laughs> and he said yes, and I responded, yes. <laughs> and this alumnus uh, was very sorry that he would not be able to see her with or without uh, Kate um, this afternoon. So it's one of the reasons that we are videotaping the lecture, so that the very large alumni pool will be able to uh, join us in uh, here again. So please join me in welcoming. Thanks very much. Now, there are only three additional copies, so the people who want to follow as I read will have to share. Um, one person over to this row. Were they scarcer in this row? I don't know. <laughs> I gave a version of this paper last fall uh, in Cambridge. Uh, it had two purposes at the time. One was to introduce Cambridge to the subject of neuroesthetics or vice versa. And the other was to introduce Cambridge to an experiment in which I was involved uh, and uh, that I thought people ought to know about. So you're getting a, a retread of that lecture. And I'm just going to read, uh, if you can tolerate that. Um, I had one moment uh, of uh, liveliness worked into the paper, uh, but uh, it expired, unfortunately, under the pressure of effective uh, technology. Uh, it's going to show a little video. It doesn't work. <laughs> so you are left with, with words alone. Now, if you want to take shortcuts through this paper, the, uh, my point is on pages 31 to 32. <laughs> <laughs> and there are two, squ two squishy places in the reasoning. One is on pages 23 to 24, and the other is on page 27. Uh, there are places where I haven't really worked out what I intended, but I wrote it out anyway, so there's a little thickery involved on these pages. Neuroesthetics as a discipline began to enter popular awareness about five years ago with the work of Margaret Livingstone, that orange book there, Samar Zeki, and Ramachandran. 
of course, the introduction of any new approach to the arts, can you hear me at the back, um, is likely to be accompanied by exaggerated claims. Think Marxist analysis, psychoanalysis, discourse analysis, the new criticism, structuralism, Bartinian heteroglossia, delusion, rhizomatics, and so on. Neuroaesthetics is no exception. I try to outline the limits of its achievements in the neural imagination. And on close inspection, these limits turned out to be extremely narrow. But neuroaesthetics isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's like a cobra. You just have to be careful by which end you pick it up. If you begin by assuming that neuroscience will eventually tell you what art is, you have it. You've already seeded the essential ground. You'll be fighting for your guard action from then on. If, on the other hand, you understand that neuroscience can tell you interesting things that are tangential to art, you may safely pursue neuroaesthetics, and art itself will remain safe. John Keats, who immersed himself in studies of the brain as a medical student, was not afraid that neuroscience would undermine poetry, as we can see from his Ode to Psyche. Sure, Benjamin Libet has proven that our own brain knows what we're going to do long before we actually do it. But presumably, Keats's brain also knew the poem he was composing before he composed it, and Mozart's brain knew the music he was composing before he, Mozart, performed it. For that matter, my brain presumably knew the sentence I'm, I'm speaking before I speak it. Does that go to prove that I'm nothing but the passive plaything of my material instantiation? Even if it's only my unconscious or pre-conscious that's speaking, it's still my unconscious. All this approach has done is move the problem of the source of consciousness one step back without bringing us any closer to solving it. What Keats understood when admiring psyche, the embodiment of thought, is that it takes a mind to marvel a brain. But to return to the question of neuroaesthetics, in my explorations of the subject, I've found only one place in music where neurology may gain a purchase on art, though there are undoubtedly others, some perhaps related to dance, some to humor, um, I myself have wondered all my life how composers succeed in making wonderful songs out of terrible texts. As Addison puts it, nothing is capable of being well set to music that is not nonsense. Pondering this problem, I began to wonder whether the solution might have something to do with the interaction of the hemispheres. Speaking of the related area of poetry, Ian McGilchrist says, that poetry has to steal a march, so to speak, on the dominant hemisphere, which is usually the left hemisphere. Our initial apprehension of the world is a holistic impression from the right hemisphere. This information is then apprehended sequentially by the left hemisphere, but in order for us to have an integrated understanding, it must return to the right hemisphere, where it is represented as a whole. We are used to seeing, seeing differently, and then seeing again. As so though percepts, uh, or impressions, ricochet back and forth, uh, if McGilchrist is right, between the hemispheres. Poetry piggybacks on this process. As McGilchrist puts it, poets have to smuggle in their jewels by distracting the officers of the left hemisphere. That's the supposedly rational one. The non-rational and musical elements of the poetry survive the journey and find shelter in the right hemisphere. In my own wording, in poetry, the right words give one access to the non-verbal. It seems to me possible that in the case of sung poetry, a transaction between the hemispheres is also involved, but in a different way. It's understood that the right hemisphere does not have strongly developed language ca capacities, but is stronger in the area of music. When the musical right hemisphere finds the word for a, words for a song dumped in its lap, so to speak, not knowing quite to do with what to do with them, it adopts them, but on its own terms, that is, on musical terms. It strips them of their own inherent musicality, of their linguistic musical DNA. 
and fills him with his own power, overwhelming the semantic content of the text. Quote, my quote for myself, music can run away with meaning whenever it chooses to do so. The result is a fusion or marriage, but a marriage in which music is dominant and dictates the terms. This amalgam once created appears to have its own cerebral niche since it's possible to arrest normal speech by transcranial magnetic stimulation without interfering with the subject's ability to sing songs. It's a very strange fact. Carlyle said that we're nothing but music. The neurologist Zeman says we ourselves are music. I myself argue that music is the fourth state of consciousness. The other three are wakefulness, non-REM sleep, and REM sleep. That music is rooted in the very basis of our being seems to be shown not only by music's ability to survive brain damage, but by its ability to influence behavior or to elicit a response when there's scarcely any brain at all. And that's the case that I was going to show you and I will not be able to. I spent my summers in Nova Scotia, and this August I was listening to CBC, last August, when I heard a program about a microcephalic child in Halifax who benefited from music therapy. On further inquiry, I was able to make contact with her foster mother, who brought the child to see me. Kimaya has a beautiful face, but at five years of age, she's unable to hold her head up or make any orderly limb movements and her fists are more or less permanently clenched. I was able to hold her. She was quite soft and limp. She does smile, though, and even laughs if joggled or has her cheeks lightly pinched. Kimaya was not expected to live beyond three months, but she's now over five years old. She's involved in physical therapy and music therapy. Now, let's see. Is someone going to show this image for me? Uh, is Wendy available? Do you have a list there? Might be, but I don't know if she's there. Let's start the... Is Wendy there? I think if you just press the bar, there we go. Thanks. Okay. Let me just see. You just press the space bar. This? Yeah. yeah. All right. This shows you Kimada's skull. Um, uh, it's largely filled with cerebrospinal fluid. She has a brain stem, a cerebellum, and a pituitary gland that's enabled her to grow. This image shows the severity of her condition when compared with that of a normal and even what is usually considered a microcephalic child. That's a normal child. This is a microcephalic child. You see how severe this is. There is, by the way, a neuroscientist sitting in the front row here, so be careful about what I say. I have a number of other images of Kamaya's skull, which apparently contain, contain some contradictory information. In one image, image there is evidence of some small sign of a cortex. Um, nevertheless, it's evident that Kamaya is surviving with extraordinarily little brain. Having seen and held Kimaya, I find it astonishing that she responds to music to the extent to which she does. Though Bjorn Merker observes in the important article which I have here that microcephalic children respond to sound even in the absence of an auditory cortex, which I find quite remarkable. Okay. Now, this is what is not working. You saw that for a moment only. This is the, the sound part of the video. Uh, anyway, it shows Kimaya during one of her music therapy sessions, and she's clearly responding to the music. She even seems to be trying to sing to reach the pitch of the guitar uh, that, uh, that is uh, being played for her. Having seen and held Kimaya, I find it astonishing, as I said, um, that she responds to music to the extent to which she does. Uh, in the video, she's much more active and responsive than she was when I saw her. She's obviously stimulated by the music. 
I've said above that the interaction of music and words in song is the only area in which I've thought neuroscience might find some purchase on aesthetics. It will be objected neuroscience should have a great deal to tell us about acoustics in music, about color relations in painting, about memory in literature. It does indeed, but it is not able, as far as I can understand, to discriminate between aesthetic events and ordinary perceptual or psychological experiences. It can account for the shimmer on the water in a Monet painting by the confusion of lumin luminance with color intensities, but it can't tell us what sets such a picture apart from examples of visual paradox in an ophthalmology textbook, or for that matter, from impressionist or post-impressionist techniques used in an advertising poster. Caught in her own neuroaesthetic trap, Livingstone ends up by admitting that, I quote, I find in large magazine images to have colors that are just as visually interesting and just as lively as post-impressionist painting. This is where the confusion between perception and art leads us. Vision, no matter how complex and interesting, is not in itself aesthetic. In the neural imagination, I say that art does not do what the brain would be doing anyway of its own accord. Art emphasizes inappropriately. Art does not duplicate the natural percept. It cancels the natural percept and replaces it with another. In a melody, what it cancels is the note as it existed outside the melody. In a song, the word as it existed outside the song. Similarly, in rhyme, meter, or other poetic devices, it works at cross purposes to the perceptual brain, continually defying our prosaic expectations and li linguistic norms. Art, Severzecki says, liberates us from a fortuitous view. That's true. But I would say it does so only by creating a view that is systematically at variance with the one provided by ordinary perception. These are my general observations on neuroaesthetics. It gives us unlimited information about the how of the work of art, but very little about the why, the meaning, or the value, and virtually nothing about the unique characteristics that distinguish one work from another and determine its importance. OK, now I go on to the experiment. This rather vague and mysterious title refers to a special undertaking of the Medical Research Council of Cognitive and Brain Sciences Unit in Cambridge. I'd noticed all my life that at sleep onset, I would often experience what I can only call intrusions, words or phrases that diverge from the images and actions current in the mind at that time. This divergence for me is virtually diagnostic of sleep onset. It marks a threshold of relaxation and a moment of recognition that it was when it's I'm entering another mental world. One friend of mine says that he has come to regard these as precious moments to be revered. Edgar Allan Poe went so far as to claim that they give one a glimpse of the spirit's outer world. In fact, Poe went on to say, should I ever write a paper on this topic, the world will be compelled to acknowledge that at last I've done an original thing. It's this paper that I'm writing at for delivering now on Poe's behalf. And it's this phenomenon that a group of scientists is attempting to explore in Cambridge. The transition, what happens to the language system in the transition between waking and sleep? It may well be asked, what is the connection between neuroaesthetics and hypnagogic intrusions? The temptation would be obvious. Might these intrusions not be poetic? Therefore, ipso facto aesthetic emanations from the creative unconscious, therefore um, manifestations of the imaginative powers latent in all of us, unfortunately they aren't. They do call for comparison with other more clearly valuable intrusions, and I'll devote the later part of the paper to an attempt to place them within a broader category, where some 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 parts of which do have aesthetic importance. 
Okay, what is the experiment? I had a cap with 240 electrodes stuck on my head, uh, and I was put in a sleepy room, um, maybe a, a, a sealed off, and encouraged to get drowsy. And as I was falling asleep, I was supposed to wake myself up and, um, and say what words were uh, happening to me uh, as I was falling asleep in relation to whatever other, whatever other background thoughts I was having. Uh, usually there was a discrepancy then between the words and the images and actions. That's the thing that we're trying to capture. Um, now, the specific aim will define a signature for the intrusions, but since the behavior of the language system uh, has never been studied, our understanding of that general process should in any case be enriched whether they succeed or not in, in capturing the intrusions in cells. Um, now, if the results of the present study um, should lead to further investigations by fMRI, um, there may be some, poss some possibility uh, that they will actually be able to see what is happening. Uh, perhaps by a reduction in the self-monitoring system, uh, perhaps by a shift in the connectivity between the linguistic uh, and, the, uh, and the visual areas, perhaps in a, in a change in the activity of the corresponding language areas in the subordinate hemisphere, or by some change in the, in the pattern. Uh, I've said there's one uh, neuroscientist here have said there are two because I see the second one examining me with an extremely quizzical look from the third row. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'll take a chance to go ahead. Um, localization, of course, even if achieved, always raises at least as many questions as it solves. Um, the, the verbal re reports, my verbal reports, of intrusions are currently being transcribed by someone at the lab, and they will be studied along various linguistic parameters. Now, just to give you a few examples of what I mean by intrusions, uh, once during this process, the words that came up on my, in my mind was that something was being served to me on a steel chaotic. Now there you have a real category shift. Uh, steel is an object and chaotic is a state of mind or, or, or in many ways, in many cases, completely different category. Uh, served on a steel chaotic rather than a steel tray. Another time, I found myself thinking about a white man's clothing, the words concerned the white man's clothing. The image was that of a guitar, of, of a horse getting into a guitar case and lying down very comfortably. <laughs> um, uh, Dolly used these images, by the way. He had a technique for waking himself up as he was falling asleep, capturing the images and hurrying to paint them. Another day, when falling asleep during a nap, I was thinking about a lady I had once met in a shoe store, when the word rector presented itself clearly to my mind. It's possible, of course, that I'd seen or heard that word somewhere recently, but if so, what had brought it back to my memory at that particular moment? The same question lingers in the background of some relevant research at the University of Hertfordshire that's come to my attention recently. Um, a group of scientists at Hertfordshire have been trying to identify the sources of verbal intrusions during wakefulness and have been working on the ones that happen as you're falling asleep. Um, what they have found is that in many cases you can trace intrusions to a prompt of some sort, sometimes recent, sometimes in a distant past. For instance, somebody's name or an image or a familiar tune pops into mind and you're amazed by its irrelevance. Uh, you may have noticed 
the head of, head of the paper, uh, OWXYZ, it was just come into my head. Uh, that's from uh, Edward Lear, of course. So what makes it pop into your head? In almost 50% of reported mind pops, <laughs> participants were able to ascertain that the actual or related contents of the mind pop had recently been encountered in one's environment or internal thoughts. These discoveries lend strong support to the theory proposed by Leibniz three centuries ago that our unnoticed peripheral perceptions, what he called the petite perception, play a very large role in our lives, although they are not apprehended consciously at the time. Wilder Penfield, of course, believed that he had succeeded in reviving, reviving these un unconscious perceptions by direct stimulation of the brain. Um, I mean, there are all kinds of you know, major problems with all of these things. For instance, I was reading recently uh, in the last issue of Scientific American an article um, by a uh, neurologist who was one of the speakers at the conference I organized, organized at Cambridge last October um, uh, that um, one of the things he says is that there are only 10,000 concepts that we can hold in mind at the same time. Now, how he gets that figure, I don't know. Uh, but if so, it just doesn't make allowances for the infinite number of peripheral concepts that we have not focused on, that we have not absorbed, that we have not specified. So I don't know uh, how they arrive at that figure. Um, what Leah Pavelashvili and other pioneering investigators of such intrusions have not yet done is determine why they occur when they do, or by what principle of selection these particular hidden memories are chosen for resurrection. After all, we have an infinite number of petite perceptions to choose from. I happened to be reading Barbara Pym's Quartet in Autumn recently, when I ran across the following passage, quote, taking out a packet of jelly babies, he, Norman, had a sudden and vivid picture of Letty. But why this should have materialized at this particular moment and with such intensity, he could not have said. Surely, nothing to do with jelly babies. I was made more complicated by the fact that Norman is actually in love with one of the women in the story, but it's not Letty. So, the Hertfordshire investigators suggest that the occurrence of verbal intrusions may be associated with both a high degree of creativity and alternatively with a tendency to schizophrenia. And they actually argue that schizophrenic hallucinations may consist of a series of such involuntary semantic memories. That's quite a claim. At this point, I encountered what seems to be a striking confirmation of the Hertfordshire group's claim that verbal intrusions are simply unnoticed memories. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that the word rector had sprung up in my mind during my hypnagogic encounter with a lady from a shoe store. Uh, just a couple of days after the rector intrusion, as I was glancing through one of their articles on verbal intrusions, my eye fell on the line C. Beck and Rector, 2003, for examples of such priming of hallucinations in their patients with schizophrenia. I had, of course, not the faintest conscious memory of that reference, nor was there anything in the context to suggest a connection with ladies in shoe stores, unless perhaps Rector recalled Beck unconsciously and I wanted to have ladies in shoe stores at my bed and call. But why then did the word rector impose itself on the memory, whereas Beck did not? Perhaps it would be better not to resort to such strained forms of explanation. In any case, the results of the Hertfordshire investigation will be an invaluable complement to our work. Um, Okay, waking intrusions might be accounted for by some unusual pressure forcing an unexpected association into consciousness at a particular juncture, perhaps 
in a momentary form of narcolepsy. We have someone in our audience who knows all about that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when one is drifting off to sleep, the gradual disengagement of the language stream from the images and action of approaching dream seems to be just an expression of the normal relaxation that accompanies the incipient sleep process. When we're falling asleep, we are for once relieved of the burden of relevance and are no longer answerable to others for the words we think or speak. Whether it be Vygotsky's self-directed speech of infancy that resumes control or some other dialect of our internal language, we have no difficulty in accepting our own language. This is the ideal place where I quote myself, the sounds we utter, whether privately or aloud, are coin of the realm, there we are ourselves as we were at the beginning. Okay. Sometimes what I've been calling intrusions are simply the consequence of language streams attaching itself to my other mental content and going its own way. Sometimes in the case, as in the case of the word rector, they cut inappropriately across whatever other language is run, running through the mind. In either case, the answer to the question why the particular hypnagogic intrusions occur do occur and at this stage be only a matter of speculation. Perhaps they're items at the head of a queue waiting their turn for expression. Perhaps they're elements of fragmentary narratives that proceed below the level of consciousness, perhaps even below what we call, usually call stream of consciousness, the literary form pioneered by Edouard Dujardin and André Biel. Perhaps they're part of the continuous dream that, as Adolfo Dionas has suggested, accompanies us all our lives, as Zeman says of his patient Lucy, as if some part of her were dreaming secretly all the time. In this case, though they'd have to be understood as representing a dream process emerging from below dream itself, since they often occur just as what we usually think of as a normal dream is getting underway. For me, they mark a threshold. They provide the guarantee that I'm actually falling asleep. I should, by the way, make it clear that the intrusions I'm describing have nothing to do with hearing voices, a phenomenon which may have pathological implications. It certainly doesn't always. My intrusions are not words actually heard, but simply presented to consciousness unvoiced. In his book on hearing voices, Music, Madness, and Prophets, Daniel Smith quotes the automatic poet Sarah Abio describing a related class of experiences while hearing her poetry. Quote, these are voices that separate themselves from the other voices of my thoughts. A sudden, different voice comes forward. Okay, section three, nonsense narrative and metaphor. Although the topic of intrusions may sound exotic, the bizarre verbal flotsam thrown up by the mind at sleep onset tends to be disappointing because it's devoid of aesthetic content or flavor. Bizarre these bits of nonsense may be, but they're on the whole strikingly uninteresting, like undigested bits of food regurgitated. These words and phrases are products of a mechanical process and there's nothing to be done with them. If this be the raw material of the stream of consciousness, or rather of one of the streams of consciousness, it doesn't indeed, in spite of what William James says, appear to itself chopped up in bits. If one can call it a flow, there's just a halting, stuttering, stumbling flow. On the other hand, figuring out what these meaningless oddities are, are about, well, I'm saying that it's worth, it's worth investigating. Uh, there's a phrase among neurologists, uh, it's, well, it's just three letters, NCC, Neural, correlate, neural correlates of consciousness. Um, a, a, a neurologist the other day suggested to me that I, what I'm doing is NCG, looking for the neural correlates of garbage. <laughs> um, as prime examples of nonsense without context and without apparent purpose, these intrusions force one into a confrontation with a large overarching topic of nonsense, its role in language and thought. Nonsense is a major topic in philosophy and linguistics, 
It's been treated in a highly technical fashion by people like Frege, Carnap, and Wittgenstein, among others. I will be using the term in a colloquial or naive manner in its various common acceptances. The random accidents of mind are frequently a source of instruction, not infrequently a source of pleasure. Who wants always to be tied to the Procrustean bed of formal language? When we think of a wrong word for something, let's say we think of watermelon instead of hypothesis, the farther the wrong word is from the right one, the more satisfying it will be, especially if, as in this case, it involves a category error. The error benefits from its inappropriateness in the same way as a metaphor does. I always use as an example from Coleridge. Anybody can say, see the fingers of the birch twigs in the spring, but it took Coleridge to say, see the chocolate mist around the birch twigs in the spring. Um, Lautremont famously satirized the cliches of metaphor when he wrote that a young man was as beautiful as the meeting of an umbrella and a sewing machine on a dissecting table. <laughs> the dissecting table gives away Lautremont's um, attitude towards metaphor. T.S. Eliot delivered another crippling blow to this trope with his evening etherized like a patient upon a table. There is a table again. And for quite a while, especially around the 1980s, metaphors such tended to be rejected. Alain Rodriguez claimed to have established a new genre, brief for metaphor, with his supposedly deadpan novels, which instead are studded with intrusions, obsessive, meaningless eruptions of asymbolic symbols, such as a stain on a wall or a seagull's eye. Metaphor has fallen afoul of other literary fashions since then, but it seems doubtful that it will lose the place assigned to it by Aristotle as the key to literary value. But every metaphor in its element of incongruity or irrelevance does have a nugget of a more or less nonsensical intrusion buried within it, as every eukaryotic cell depends on the alien ancestral bacterium encapsulated in its mitochondria. As Don Mackay, the excitement of metaphor stems from the injection of wildness into language. Rhyme and meter, although apparently expressions of regularity, are actually ways of soliciting this wildness, of teasing the unconscious to peek out of its lair, in other words, of purposefully soliciting intrusions. With luck, what one then sometimes gets is a collaboration between the deliberate and the accidental, the volitional and the effortless. But Edward Lear gives the unconscious, the stranger within, bigger bait. He shows it that he's willing to accept anything that it throws at him. He offers equally enthusiastic hospitality to the relevant and the irrelevant. There is no censorship here. The door stands wide open. There was an old man in a pew whose waistcoat was spotted with blue, but he tore it to pieces to give his nieces that cheerful old man. Now there's a digression on Edward Lear versus metaphor. In his own way, Lear is more subversive than are the declared enemies of metaphor. Lear's nonsense in the limericks is not metaphoric. Metaphors are often many allegories awaiting interpretation. They invite us to translate them into a rational language. But Lear's limericks are short-circuited metaphor. Whatever hopes we may have had, that the old man of Thames Dutton's being forced to sit on a hat has a moral to it. Whatever hopes we've had are dashed by the last line, you abruptious old man of Thames Dutton. Lear's limericks are traps that lead us to expect the familiar devices of metaphor as they go about their business of mediating between dream and rationality with a lifeline thrown toward the shore of our familiar world. But Lear's poems do not end up where we think they will. They remain in unsafe, unsettled territory, such places as the land where the bong tree grows, because they reject paraphrase into any neutral vocabulary. The bong tree can't be anything but what it is. It is the most specific thing possible. It is not definable by anything other than itself. Let nonsense remain nonsense, or as Berlin said, 
to the rest of literature, all the rest is merely literature. While working to undo the pretensions of metaphor, Lear creates a different reality, one that can stand on its own feet, or if it prefer, dance at the light of the moon. It is often argued that novelty in thought is itself dependent on a form of intrusion, on catechesis, that is, on metaphors that do not quite hit their mark, unexpectedly reformulating ideas in approximate or symbolic ways. So, for instance, my comparison of the search for a neurological signature of intrusions with the search for the Higgs boson, I skip that, may be merely misleading. But Darwin's possibly having used the behavior of the stock market, with which he was intensely preoccupied, as a basis for the concept of natural selection in biology proved co consequential whether he was entirely right or not. Nothing significant comes to light unless we strike the target off center. Nonsense is, of course, particularly important not only for metaphor, but for poetry in general. And it's interesting to, to compare the genuine nonsense of hypnagogic intrusions with the pretended nonsense of nonsense poetry. I think I'll skip page 23, especially since it contains one of those squishy spots in there. Here it would be just so, yeah. I'll go on to page 24. I'm a little ashamed of page 23. <laughs> Incidentally, I believe that the so-called language or sound poems, to the extent that I understand their work, are doing the wrong thing. Maybe quite a claim in 306. <laughs> I believe that some meaning clings to every sound when one is using language, and it's not possible to divest sounds in speech or language of their associations. In playing with sound, one is necessarily playing with meaning. Again, I'm going to skip the next section, though. My daughter says it's the only interesting thing. I never respect that. OK, I go to the bottom of 25. To return to the difference between hypnagogic intrusions and metaphors, metaphors, despite the elements of randomness and irrelevance that's crucial to their nature, are the products of the self. There's always a self felt behind them, a person and a person in the world. Hypnagogic intrusions, in contrast, are mechanical and impersonal, they could be anybody. Okay, section four, the frame. <coughs> Part of my initial remit for the conference in which I originally gave this paper was to try to create some sort of framework for the experiment. I've been trying to bring the subject of that experiment, hypnagogic verbal intrusions, into relation with the broader topics of nonsense and metaphor. So far, though, I've succeeded only in creating what might be called a negative framework. They are not expressions of creative spontaneity, like Kubla Khan, and they or their equivalents occur in nonsense poetry as only as something to be teased or played with while we're on our way galumphing back to the ra rational anchor of the poem, even if that poem be Jabberwocky. I've said before, even the kernel of nonsense within, within a metaphor has to fall back, finally, on the security of the tenor. If you know the distinction between tenor and vehicle, tenor, Achilles is a lion, uh, Achilles is a tenor, lion is a what these intrusions can do, though, as I've said, is help us to realize how very different mere nonsense is from the aesthetic in any form. The aesthetic, no matter how confused it may seem, always has an element of order and an element of self-consciousness about it. Now, again, page 27, that's another of my lies. And, <laughs> and I have to admit that I'm not fully confident of that important statement. In an effort to get at this problem, the distinction between the products of the creative unconscious and mere nonsense, from another angle, I could cite a passage from Hawthorne on the transition from sleep to waking. I quote, when the imagination is a mirror imparting vividness to all ideas without the power of selecting or controlling them, end quote. 
But more to the point is a well-known passage from John Dryden's preface to his play, The Rival Ladies. Dryden speaks of a stage at which the play was still, I quote, only a confused mass of thoughts tumbling over one another in the dark, when the fancy was yet in its first work, moving the sleeping images of things towards the light, there to be distinguished and then either chosen or rejected by the judgment." End quote. How are these sleeping images of things different from my intrusions? And what were some of them images of these images, presumably grown from memory, more valuable than others? Are the rejected ones similar to my intrusions? At least the valuable ones seem to have benefited by their passage through the sleeping or unconscious state becoming material for metaphor. Metaphor is the physical face of thought polished by sleep. That's my sentence. I stand by it, though I have no idea what it means. To <laughs> quote Shakespeare, when these the valuable images of memory fade from consciousness, they become subject to a, quote, sea change into something rich and strange, end quote. In sleep, they have become something better, more interesting than, different from, the merely representational conscious images that they were before their transmutation. They have undergone a process of digestion by the unconscious mind. Perhaps they belong to that part of memory that according to a recent issue of the new scientist, is meant for building the future and merely recalling the past. I went to part of a very interesting lecture yesterday by Sergei Dolgopolsky has a new book called The Open Past, which is about memory and its discovery and creation. Um, where was I? Yeah. Henry James has summed up the beneficent revisions of memory magisterially in another famous preface, the belated introduction to his novel, The American. The idea for that work had come to James abruptly while he was riding in an American horse car. I quote, I was charmed with my idea, which would take, however, much working out, and precisely because it has so much to give, I think, I must have dropped it for the time into the deep well of unconscious cerebration. That was a popular phrase in the 19th century. Not without the hope, doubtless, that it might eventually emerge from that reservoir, as one had already known the buried treasure to come to light with a firm iridescent surface and a notable increase of weight. But what of the percepts that have, so to speak, never fallen asleep? and so have never been subject to this process of improve, unconscious improvement. Although in approaching the question of intrusions, I was sure that this was new territory for me and that I had never thought about it before, I've been embarrassed to realize that I've actually once written about it, though in a totally different context. I'm assuming that my intrusions represent not the successes but the failures of memory things that can't be forgotten because they haven't been remembered, naturally. Haven't been, can't be forgotten because they haven't been remembered. They haven't been properly assimilated, or perhaps they've been filed in the wrong place, like Sybil's leaves left undeciphered, blown by the wind into a trash pile, or perhaps into the neurological equivalent of a trash pile. I last wrote about this subject in 19... 87 in the Orpheus and Eurydice chapter of my book on literature and ethics called Find Your Virtue. There I refer to such rejected images as widowed and <coughs> and I class them with the images presented only as meaningless objects common in works by Gogol, Roussel, Camus, Sartre, and the previously mentioned Rebrille among others works in which the atmosphere of meaninglessness sometimes becomes so pervasive that they seem to refer to a world that is already dead or only alive enough to suffer from its condition. The clearest description of such an object, a widowed object, or a real intrusion, clearest description is given by Gerard Manley Hopkins, of all people. Hopkins describes a piece of wood that he has seen in a daydream. That's what he says, saw it in a daydream. 
In other words, it's a visual intrusion and clearly defined as such. He realizes that the object he is seeing, this piece of wood, was part of an outhouse. Now I quote Hopkins directly. I had seen it longer together and had that day been wondering what it was. In reality, it is used to hold a little heap of cinders against the wall, which keep from the frost a piece of earthenware pipe, which there comes out, up and comes out, and goes in again, making a projection in the wall. Now, this is a passage to be remembered. This is Hopkins. It is just the things which produce dead impressions, which the mind, either because you cannot make them out, or because they are perceived across other more engrossing thoughts, has made nothing of and brought into no scaping that force themselves up in this way afterwards. There are these dead alive things that you can't get rid of that always come back because you haven't dealt with them the right way at the time you perceive them or have perceived them. Brought into no scaping, that's a, a, a Hopkins phrase. Scaping is the act by which you create what you perceive. It's the act by which you make meaningful your perceptions. This is almost the opposite of what Henry James refers to. I can think of no clearer description of an intrusion of its source and of its arrested trajectory through the mind so that it becomes a revenant, a ghost in French, current, something that comes back, an aimless wandering ghost never quite to be put to rest. Unlike those objects that, as Hopkins puts it, have been brought into escaping by the mind, have been given a place and a meaning, it can never partake in an aesthetic experience. Here then, at last, we may have a partial framework for the topics of intrusions and of nonsense. There are two kinds of nonsense then, the good and the bad, which rest respectively on good and bad memories. That's the point of this whole paper. There are two kinds of nonsense, the good and the bad, which rest respectively on good and bad memories. The good intrusion is drawn from pre-digested memories. Those, perhaps, were the words worthy and aura, memories perfected that can be used for metaphors, which I have elsewhere in my essay on Miquelon called, called metaphors, the seeing of an imperfect image through a perfect one. The bad intrusion is inert. It has no flavor and no overtones. It has not been digested or understood. Uh, that essay on Miquelon is hard to find. If anyone is really interested, I can tell you where to look for it. OK, the bad intrusion is inert. It has no flavor and no overtones. It has not been digested or understood. In the effort to find or create a frame for our experiment then, it may be possible to situate the intrusion vis-a-vis -vis the broader, broader background of aesthetics in relation to other forms of nonsense, in relation to metaphor, even possibly in relation to some implicit narrative. As far as getting closer to the neurophysiological background from which intrusions arise is concerned, though, the most we can hope for at this stage is to identify the EEG signature of the intrusive process as a first step towards understanding the neurology of free association. And Beckenstein, who is the head of the team, has in fact located what he calls a docking point, the point at which the intrusions begin, which is better than nothing, I guess. Perhaps these events reflect a weakening of the self-monitoring system that usually accompanies speech. That is, if you assume that there is a conceptual background for speech rather than Daniel Dennett's pandemonium model in which various things just crowd in uh, incoherently and one sort of prevails. Uh, and these events also have some affinity with Wernicke's or fluent aphasia. Perhaps they are in fact like bits of the word salad heard in some cases with schizophrenia or when salient like no moments of tourettism. One friend suggests that they may give us a glimpse of a sorting process going on somewhere in the brain, because after all, there's probably some reason for the death. It must be happening for a purpose. 
This possibility has been developed at length by Sue Llewellyn in a forthcoming article in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, Such Stuff as Dreams Are Made On, Elaborative Encoding, The Ancient Art of Memory in the Hippocampus, which argues that the stuff of dreams is the stuff of memory. I think it's a bad article at least, but at least it's very, it's very ambitious. Certainly, if our memories are what make up our dreams, as well as hypnagogia, there are memories that have been put through a shredder and reassembled according to principles into which we have so far little insight. Um, a colleague of mine, um, Rajendra Bhagdayan, has proposed um, that intrusions may result from an overload of information in area V3A of the visual cortex during hypnagogia. I don't know how seriously to take that theory. Um, in any case, if we accept Dryden's metaphor, or perhaps his catachresis, his approximate metaphor, hypnagogic intrusions are among the least promising of the offerings on the conveyor belt of images and ideas ushered towards the light by fancy. They seem, voiced, they seem voiced by what Shelley calls the central stone of sullen lead, the very last among the confused streams of forces clamoring for articulation and recognition in our intentional life. so intricate that I didn't know what else to do. Um, and uh, reading so much in sh such a short time is also not a good idea, but thank you for your patience. And I'm sure you would be willing to